What's up everyone, Zach Seif here, and today we're gonna go over how I use my Axe FX3 live. So let's go over what I do in the Axe FX3 so that I can get the tone that's in my head into the front of house and in-ear speakers for everyone else to hear. So taking a look here at the Fractal Audio Systems Axe Edit 3, you can see that this is the exact signal chain that I use for Crash the Party. It's also the same for Evolution X minus a pitch block that I need for Crash the Party. So today we're gonna focus with the Crash the Party because that's what you guys are gonna be hearing in all my future gig vlogs. So pretty straightforward in terms of what I'm doing. I'm just taking what I would use in real life with a traditional amplifier and speaker cabinet combination and a pedal board and just putting it into the fractal. I'm not doing anything super crazy. Starting first, we have our input block with a noise gate. And this is just so that when I take my hand off the guitar, there's no extraneous noise coming through until I actually want to play. Right, so just to kind of clean up the noise floor a little bit there, it's not aggressive at all, a two ratio, default attack and release, and you just basically adjust the threshold to get what you need, so. Here, fully off, nothing happening. You'll just kind of set it to where you need it to be. Uh, better to explain this using like a distorted preset, so let's go here real quick. Right, so you can hear a little bit of that noise. Right, hands off the guitar. You don't want that coming through the speakers, so you just slowly bring up the threshold until that goes away. And you just wanna play with a good balance between making sure the extra noise isn't there and it totally choking out your signal. So find a good balance that you can live with. You know, something like that. So going back to the clean channel real quick, we'll go through my signal path top to bottom and what I do to get the most out of the unit using the least amount of DSP possible. So very first thing in the signal chain is the pitch block, which I can turn on and off with the foot controller, just like that. And the reason I have a pitch block is because there's a handful of tunes where I need to go from standard to E flat within the same mashup. Again, Crash the Party is more of like a DJ set where it's song after song. And if I need to get a different tuning, I don't really have time to sit there on stage detuning everything or swapping guitars. Could I? Sure. Do I want to? No, not at all. So the virtual capo works pretty well for that. And the reason why I have it set up like this with the new scene ignore feature, which is now also on the FM3, is that I can turn on the pitch block. Right now I'm a half step down and I can go to my gain sound and it's still on. And it won't turn off until I click it off. And it'll stay off until I turn it back on. So very important feature there. Next is the wah. I have an expression pedal down here and I can use the wah on all of my sounds anytime. All right, so I can use that whenever I want. I don't use it a lot in Crash the Party, but I'll probably find ways to throw it in here and there. Now, the reason why the level is so low is because I'm still having trouble while keeping the exact clean tone that I want and then not having the wad distort it too much. Right, so it's a little quiet for my preference, but if I were to take that off completely, you'll hear the amp start to break up and distort if I use the wah. It also totally depends on the guitar that I'm using, so I'm still kind of messing around with that a little bit to get the best desired result. So I'll probably leave that on say minus three for now. I could also use a compressor afterwards, but I'm trying really hard to stay away from having the compressor always on for my clean channel, which I've been doing for years, and I'm trying to break away from that just to get even more dynamic with my playing. So after that, 
compressor, which I do use on my chorus channel, which I'll switch to now because that's the next effect. It's just a two to one to kind of tighten everything up. For stuff like girls just wanna have fun. Um, very light compression just to make sure that my high notes and low notes are coming through nice and evenly like an 80s guitar tone. Chorus, we're using the Japanese CE2 from Boss. It's the best chorus. When you think of a chorus effect, this is what it sounds like in my opinion. It's very lush, very rich. I really just, I left most things on default right at one. I messed with the depth a little bit and the mix at 50%. And it just kind of works for this. You'll see when I go to my ambient tone, Right, I still have the CE2, but I'm also a fan of the Dimension Chorus. So, I'm, I'm back and forth between the two of them. I use the Dimension quite a bit, as you'll see later with this extra chorus block that I have, but we'll get to that later. So for my ambient patch, it's the same as my chorus patch, except I have a delay turned on, right? And it's a stereo ping pong sort of thing where the delays feed back into each other. I picked up this trick from John Petrucci. I use it on all of my lead tones and also my ambient tone. And then I also have a plex delay to just add a little bit of shimmer. I'm gonna turn that off and play a passage. Now I'll turn it back on and you can see what it's adding, right? So this is without any of the delays. Right, so all you're hearing is the reverb, which is a Andromeda. These are all kind of based around like an ambient, almost Charmin Big Sky sort of delay where you have a little bit of pitch shifting and modulation happening on the reverb to give it space. Now I could get away with just using this reverb and be totally happy. Right, it adds a little brightness and life to it. Now I'm gonna turn on the delay and you'll hear that it just kind of thickens everything up with these repeats. Right, sounds pretty nice. And if I wanna do stuff like or right just kind of adds a little bit more texture like the edge from YouTube turning on the plex delay you'll hear a little bit more of that shimmer I'm going to turn everything off except for that so you can just hear what this plex delay is doing it's very subtle but it's there kind of that upper end I'll turn up the mix so you can hear it a little bit more. See, so what it's adding different octaves and harmonies to my tone to kind of thicken it up a little bit. I, you gotta be careful with the mix because it can be very overpowering, especially in a live situation. Probably leave that around three, right? So ambient tone is, I use it for more arpeggios and lush kind of pad sounds. Especially for songs that don't really have guitar, I can just add a little. So that I'm not really playing guitar, but more adding another texture to the sound, and I love doing that live. So that basically takes care of the clean tones. Um, the rest of the stuff really applies to my distorted tones. So we're gonna switch over to that real quick. So here we are on my crunch tone. Let's go through the amp, right? I'm using the same amp for every single preset. On my clean, it is the JP2C plus green channel, which is the clean channel on the physical amp. These are the settings that I'm using. All right, pretty basic clean tone. For my crunch, I'm using the same amp, but the yellow, which is the crunch setting. And I have all of this figured out so that I have a full saturated sort of crunchy overdriven sound that's not so overdriven and compressed and in your face 
but it's still aggressive enough to kind of cut through, mix, and sound the way that a distorted amp will. <laughs> You know, you can hear a lot of clarity and definition in the notes, but it also kind of just holds it all together. So that's the settings I'm using on that. Output EQ, as many of you know, Mesa Boogie Amplifiers, the Mark series in particular, is known for their 5-band graphic EQ. This is very important to dial in for the mix, so I have everything set in sort of a variation of that V-shape. And if you notice, some of these numbers aren't super specific, and also I have a little yellow dot here on the 750 fader. We're gonna get to what that does when we get to the lead tone. Uh, before we go any further though, the reverb that I use on my crunch channel is just a little room reverb so that in the in-ears, it just gives it a little breathing room so it's not a microphone directly in front of your face. And I'll show you what it sounds like without the reverb and then with. Pretty awesome. Turn it on. Just adds a little bit of room sound to make it feel more like an amp in the room sort of thing. Speaker cabinet is the same for all of the amps, so we'll talk about it now. I'm using the 412 rectifier with an SM7 and a 412 USA traditional with a Royer 121. These are effectively the same cabinet, the rectifier and the traditional are both based on Mesa Boogie, California, USA. Speaker cabinets, the big brother of the 212 that I have. And with these low cuts, I'm just cutting out below 75. Normally, I default to somewhere between 80 and 120. However, cutting off the 80, there's just a little bit lacking in the in-ears, so I have it set to 75. Probably doesn't make a difference. It's just me being anal about the tone. Both cabinets are set to that. And the high cut around 6,200. If you notice, I used to only cut 8,000 and above. And I've been slowly coming down after realizing that all of those really high end frequencies, you don't need them in a mix. You really, really don't need them. And by taking out just somewhere between that six and a half to 8,000 range, you can hear vocal delivery, cymbals, and just more of the mix better. So I highly experiment you cut somewhere between 5,000 and 8,000 hertz and just kind of sweep it so that it sounds more like an actual speaker cabinet and less high fidelity. So let's move on to my lead tones and they're effectively the same for both my crunch and lead, just the, the main difference being the amplifier. So what we have going on here is I have a compressor just to even out notes, and this is mostly for tapping passages and to get a little bit more sustain. I noticed that playing a few solos live, I was not getting as much evenness as I would like from, say, the traditional Mesa Boogie amp. So just a little bit of compression in front. And again, it's really just to even out tapping licks. You get a more even attack out of it that way. Amp, same idea, but coming back to the 750 fader, it's now at zero, whereas in my rhythm tone, it was at minus two, now it's at zero. So instead of wasting DSP or processing power by having another EQ block, what I did is I assigned a scene controller to it. Okay, so what this means is you're just assigning like a digital button or a digital knob to it. And then I can come over here to where it says controllers, go to scene controls, you get four of them. And now you can mess with the settings. So this basically allows you to re-EQ the amp for different channels, different scenes, different amps. It's fantastic. Instead of having another EQ in the block, you can just change how much of that mid-range you have by just typing in different numbers, it is insane. And the reason why you want more mids in your solo tone is because it helps to lift you up in the mix a little bit and helps the guitar cut a little bit more. Um, I also have that same delay from the ambient tone, but different times. And again, those feed back into each other. And then I have a slightly bigger room sound going on. Same cabinets, a um, little bit more gain. I have the gain set to another scene controller so that for the rhythm, my gain is at four, and then for my leads, 
it's at a six, so a uh, seven. It would be really great if I could read what was on the screen. So my lead tone ends up sounding like this. <laughs> Right, just kind of gives the notes a little bit of life and this is a good time to talk about the phaser and the chorus that I have. So if you notice, these are assigned to a bypass, to a control switch. What a control switch allows you to do on the fractal is on your foot controller, whatever you use, you can basically assign any parameter at all to like a button that you can press on and off. So if I press this button, phaser turns on. <laughs> So on and so forth, I click it, it turns back off. Same thing for this chorus down here. This is when I want to add chorus specifically to a passage. And I'll show you what I use that for a little bit later. So that's my lead tone. We're going to shift gears a little bit and go to my piezo. So on half of my guitars that I use live, Music Man has an acoustic piezo system in the bridge, usually a Fishman style. Right. I'm always tweaking it, just making small adjustments, but all I'm doing here is running into a front end compressor that allows the acoustic to sound more even. You just adjust it to taste. If you turn the ratio too high, it kind of chokes out the dynamics and the fullness. On a lower setting, it opens up a little more. And I mean, if I turn it off, it's fine, but I like to kind of just bring everything in a little bit more, kind of glue it all together. No amp. It's just running into a reverb, which again, you can kind of mess with. I chose the hall because it gave it just a little bit more depth to work with. So again, it's not over the top, it just kind of works. Then for the speaker cabinet, this is super important. You could use the factory default totally flat and it would sound the same way that you'd expect a direct piezo sound to be interpreted. I went and downloaded a couple acoustic IRs based off of Martin, cause I'm a big Martin guy. I have a custom Martin and I wanted to get a similar kind of feel and sound when I play live. So I have a little bit of a low cut just to cut out the mud and rumble, the mmm of an acoustic guitar. Left the high cut where it is. And basically what this is doing is applying the EQ curvature of a Martin guitar to my piezo to give it a little bit more of a realistic tone. I'll turn it off. This is what it sounds like without. Right, it's very in your face, very not so good. You turn this on. And it's basically just acting as an EQ, right? Like a preset EQ to sound more like an acoustic guitar. This is probably a pretty good time to talk about what's at the very end of my signal chain before these outputs here is my JFET compressor. So I'm a big studio guy. You guys know that I produce all my own content here. And just from trial and error and experience, I know that adding a JFET style or 1176 style compressor to my guitar chain just helps bring everything to life a little bit more. It evens it out, it sweetens everything up, and it makes it sound more professional. So I run this at the very end of my signal chain so that my levels get balanced out and to give everything just a little bit more width and depth. So it just helps even peaks and stuff like that. So I'm never clipping uh, my outputs or anything. Uh, tone wise, it's very unnoticeable. I'm gonna to go to my main rhythm tone here. And again, similar idea, 
Mesa Boogie JP2C red channel, which is the higher gain of the two gain channels. My EQ is set the way I like it. I'll put EQ a little bit different from my yellow channel and same reverb, same cabs, and it sounds like this. <laughs> That is, that is the tone, in my opinion. It's just so badass. This is where the chorus comes in. If I want to really open up a section, mostly the chorus, I'll kick in the chorus. So we come here to this one that I have. I'll click on my foot switch, and now it's on, as you can see. And I'm using a Dimension 1. Again, pick this trick up from Alex Lyson and Petrucci, and now it sounds like this. <laughs> It just adds width, depth, and what I like to call little cojones to the tone. I'll turn it off and play just a quick little chord progression. Now with the chorus. So I'll kick that in every now and then when I'm sustaining chords or playing cool arpeggiated passages and choruses to just kind of beef everything up, especially if I'm doing something like Mr. Brightside, I can just kick that on. Turn it back off. Nice and easy. So we'll get to my final tone, which is the red channel lead tone. Same idea, a little bit more gain, a little bit more mids, just to prove that. Again, here is that 750 fader coming all the way up, and then the gain coming from seven to eight and a half, and it just gives me a nice liquid tone. <laughs> I mean, come on, that's just a killer tone. And then just to kind of wrap things up, I have three different outputs. Output one are my stereo outs that feed into our in-ear system. We have a splitter so that I get an exact copy of the signal and then front of house gets an exact copy of the signal. So I can adjust my volume exactly how I want without affecting what the audience hears and the front of house engineer can adjust and do whatever he needs to get it to sound good in the room without affecting what I hear. Super simple setup. Output three is if I'm using a full range speaker. I honestly don't really care for full range speakers. The dimensions of the cabinet and the speakers themselves do impart their own tone and color. I have yet to find a full range speaker that sounds as good as these studio monitors. Yes, I'm well aware that my monitors are only seven inch monitors and we're working with 12 inch speakers when it comes to full range. I, I can't get it to sound anywhere close to how good it sounds going direct but it's there in case I need it. I'll put four if I do use stage volume and I have my way of having a traditional speaker cabinet. I'm running a Seymour Duncan SD170 power amp in the back of the rack connected to output four that I can plug into any speaker cabinet that I want and it'll give me more of a realistic tone and feel. And if you notice, I do not have the speaker cabinets there for obvious reasons. You don't want a speaker cabinet running into a real speaker cabinet. Defeats the purpose. Remember with modeling gear, you are recreating the parts of your rig that you don't have. If you already have something, you don't need to model it as well. It'll just clash and often give you an unpleasant signal. 
Now just about wraps up today's video. I hope that I was able to show you all enough tips, tricks, and hints to get your guitar tone the way that you needed to sound in a live application. We went over direct front of house and in your monitor use, also using a full range speaker or a traditional speaker cabinet with a power amplifier. I went over things such as equalization and compression to make sure that your guitar tone never gets lost in the mix. Again, be sure to check me out on social media. I post regular content there on a daily basis. Subscribe to the channel. I'm almost at a thousand subs. It would help out a lot. As always, leave your thoughts and opinions in the comments below. Keep on rocking. Keep on following your dreams. I'll see you all next time.